Welcome back to another episode of Radical Narrative. I am Mylan Tatusis, still in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, making episodes all summer long. Today in the episode, we are reaching across the ocean and visiting with Ricky Lee Waipuka Russell. She is widely recognized for her memorable portrayal of Chardonnay in the acclaimed film Boy, directed by the talented Taika Waititi, who some of you are likely familiar with. She'll also be discussing other films and projects she has partaken in, and also experience with theater, which brought her to our territory over here on Turtle Island in North America. In recent years, Ricky Lee's passion has led to doing work behind the camera, where she now works and is employed by Sweet Shop and Green, where she wholeheartedly dedicates herself to First Nations Indigenous-based projects as a development assistant, while on her way to becoming a full-time producer and director of film projects. Much of her work is ensuring that authentic voices and identities play a vital role in preserving and safeguarding cultural heritage, as well as the cultural and indigenous representation is sound and honest. Listen in as we discuss colonialism, young stardom, unforeseen career paths, and the Maori presence in media. This is another great episode that advocates for not only indigenous actors, but for more indigenous people and representation doing the work behind the scenes and behind the camera. I really hope you enjoyed this one. It was a pleasure to record, so be sure to stay tuned and listen in. Awesome. Ricky Lee Russell Waipuka. Funny story, we've been following you on Instagram for a while, and over the past few years during COVID and the pandemic, I've been shooting you a DM trying to get your attention and saying, hey, do you want to see our Michael Jackson dance moves? (laughs) And you liked it for the past two years, and I shot it again this year, and you liked it. (laughs) So I decided to say, hey, let's reach out and say, ask if she wants to get on the pod, and you agreed to jump on the podcast, so here you are. (laughs) And for our listeners who aren't aware, that's a direct line from the film Boy, which we will be discussing. But go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, um, kura tato, uh, ko Ricky Lee, Russell, Waipuka, tōku ingoa. He uri tēnei uh, no Ngāti Kaunganu, Ngāti Raukawa, me Ngāti Mutunga. Um, aye, so I uh, just introduced you um, to the iwi, my tribal affiliations on both sides of uh, my family, on my mother's side and my um dead side um and yeah just um he, he mihi nui kia koe, uh, for reaching out big acknowledgements to you for <laughs> reaching out um and um having having me um on the podcast today yeah so you're coming at us from new zealand right so through the power of the internet like we just said but mm-hmm. also through the power well i don't want to say power i'll edit that out <laughs> but also <laughs> the reality that we have the same colonizer in our past where we're speaking both speaking a colonial tongue being able to understand Mm. each other so it's cool you positioned your language and who you are um but some of our audience may not be familiar with your lands your territories and your waters so if you could give us a little bit of background in terms of your heritage even your family story um or just specifically where you come from that'd be great yeah of course so um the tau toku papa on my father's side i um have tribal affiliations to the um more southern part of the north island of aotearoa um also known as tika maui um so yeah down um where our capital is wellington sort of just on the east coast of of that way um and then funnily enough there's a mountain range that goes kind of down the middle of of um our whenua our lands and on the other side of the mountain range of the tararuas is where my mother is from um so otaki uh that yeah that's where my mum um that whanau family are from um uh roa mahanga is the the main river that um i connect with um that flows through um all of these mountain ranges um past the township where my family are from all the way up to the coast um yeah so those are those are like the lands that i um 
have connections to um, the waters. Um, and, and yeah, my, so my, my whanau, my family um, come all basically live in one town called Masterton, which is just over the mountain ranges from um, our capital. Um, Masterton, yeah, so pretty much all on one road. We've got my nan, our like, you know, stronghold, and then across the road is the uncle, and then down the road is the cousin. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just all, all around that town. Um, uh, my... My family uh, come from like um, like farming sort of farming and sharing sort of background um, and fishing. A lot of our a um, lot of my cousins and uncles. My dad's still a fisherman, um, working on the cray pots, crayfish. I don't know if you guys have much crayfish up there, but yeah, not where we're at, but we're, they're familiar with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, kind of like lobster, yeah. I guess. Um, and then, yeah, then other than that, it's just work. a lot of them work with the, with the land, like um, growing, growing um, kai and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then with my mum, her family are kind of all, all over the place. Um, one was over in <laughs> England, of all places, for, for many years. Um, and a few in different parts of of New Zealand, um, and so I was born down down those ways. But I have spent majority of my time growing up in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, um, and I moved up here with my with my mum when I was around about six. Um, and yeah, and then I have two two younger brothers that um, I have grown up with up here in in, in the north. Nice, <laughs> the, the north, yeah, different context for us, right? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. that's sick. that's cool. Um, and yeah, thanks for sharing that with us because one of the interesting things up here we're dealing with in North America, Canada, and the United States is the presence of pretendians who tend not to talk about where they come from <laughs> or who they're connected to. So you walking us through this whole family lineage and heritage and, and, and tie to places, something I welcome and something I want to do on future episodes with all our guests. Um, because yeah, you, you hit home the, the fact and the reality of you are who you are and where you're from. No questions asked. Um, so you explain the territory, you explain your family, the landscape. Um, but what I want to ask is for you to, um really explain it like what's your favorite features of your territory and your land like what comes to mind when you when you see it like what do you appreciate i i followed you well i've been following you on instagram and you had this cool um, post about how you were exploring these rock formations and i'm assuming what you said on there was that a settler lady or a white lady or whatever you call them um shouted at you <laughs> not to trespass or something uh -huh. so yeah explain like the landscape to us because that's something that really i feel stands out to a lot of our listeners who are artists who are land-based practitioners i know one guy out there listens to the ter uh, the episodes while he's out hunting or on his way to hunt so explain your territory like in terms of the features for me there's sort of tohu the symbol for me um which signifies when I know I'm home is when I hit the mountains yeah our manga for me are, are really significant in in our in our culture we acknowledge them as our as our tupuna as our ancestors uh, um so they're not like necessarily just uh you know a, a land formation we acknowledge them as either our grandfather or our, our grandmother um and I guess this concept is one of the reasons where there is such a, a cultural clash from indigenous First Nations cultures and um you know the colonizers, mm -hmm. I guess, because they don't have that that honunga, that connection in the same sense that we do as it's just something that they that they work something that they use to have or something that they you know, mm -hmm. you know build on and all of these sorts of um 
I guess like in a practical sense that, that's all it is to them but for us these these um, landmarks are, are our fun are our, our family they look after us they provide for us um, and so that's why we call our side ourselves kaitiaki um, guardians of the land um, because you know we are just um, visitors at the end of the day they are forever here um, so it's up to us to treat them with respect as how we treat our elders. Yeah, so your connection to land is really important and it's home. Yeah, so for me, coming back to your original question, going going back home, hitting, the, hitting those, those maunga, hitting those mountain ranges is um, for me when I, I get the, huh, I'm home, you know, that kind of feeling. Um, yeah. We do have um, mountain ranges up here in Tamaki Makoto, but it's more of a volcanic sort of landscape up here. So there's something crazy like 42 dormant volcanoes. But for me, when I go back home, there, it, you have to pass a certain point to reach our um, my territory. So, yeah, that's like the you're back home moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's legit. And I feel that would speak to a lot of like uh, indigenous people here who listen in uh, because, yeah, we have those similar relationships as land based people in terms of our traditional territory and even our practices. And, and like you even speak into how, you know, non-indigenous people don't necessarily have that similar relationship really does play out here, too. Mm. Um, like our sacred sites, our sacred territories. Um, we have names for them. Mm. right? We have names for them and, and they don't. Right. <laughs> or they rename it. So. Yeah, definitely legit in terms of what you're talking about here. Mm, I think um, what's a, a, a territory south from here, Wanganui, they are the first um, tribe to take their river to be um, acknowledged and caught as a living being and not just a river, which is probably, it is definitely, I think it's the first of its case to, uh, you know, have one of these things that we acknowledge as as living things, as as beings, as tupuna. Um, but it, yeah, it's the first time we've had in any of those sort of ancestors, I guess, acknowledged as actual living beings in, in the system, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, it was pretty massive here when um, that went through, which I think is something anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I'll link an article in the show notes so people can look at it. Yeah, I, we heard about it. We definitely heard about it. And I remember hearing and reading about it, too, a little bit in terms of my work in academia. Um, and I do know a lot of people tend to look up to the Mari and uh, what goes on in New Zealand because, yeah, there's some unique stuff there. And we're sort of hearing it now on the podcast with how you're positioning yourself and even making reference to the river now being recognized as a as a living being, uh, which is pretty unique to hear for sure. Um, mm. Definitely for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I could tell if there are some people that were just being like, oh, that's just silly, it's nuts. Mm -hmm. Like, what's next? We're going to be acknowledging, you know, like just those types of attitudes and stuff. But it's, yeah. for me, I mean, I help assist to host quite a few um, different wānanga for um, university students that come and do semester, like a couple of semesters over here in, um, in New Zealand at our uni. And mm -hmm. they're a lot of the time they're from all over all different walks of life and when we have like these wānanga these workshops of like getting to know each other and then understanding what you know what everyone is what their intentions are of their experience abroad for them once we start kind of understanding their background and their worldview and then they see ours sometimes these these like attitudes and all of that becomes so clear on why there is such a disconnect between cultures because mm. it's just completely it's like living on an upside down world yeah um and we always find once we have these wānanga there's just so much more understanding and respect and um a lot of the time we get feedback from the students and they're like man if, if just the world had protocols and processes like we've just been through over like two days it was two days yeah. that it took to get a deep understanding of each other um, and not everyone agreed on everything that we spoke about, but at least we were able to understand where it was coming from. And I felt uh, helped assist them with respect for each other for the rest of their semester. Um, so, yeah, that's um, something I'm pretty proud of, our tikanga. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's really cool. And then, yeah, I guess, yeah, I had similar experiences being an educator with, you know, non-Indigenous students starting to sort of tap into um, the different worldview that they weren't brought up in. Mm. Um, and yeah, begin to sort of ground themselves a little bit, being a little bit more uh, humane and open. But yeah, you're definitely on point with how you're acknowledging and, and speaking to this, like um, the worldviews mm. are so different, uh, so different. And I guess that brings me into the next question too. Um, obviously no indigenous people in the world are exempt from colonialism. We all have a relationship to it. And even now us being able to speak to each other in English is a sort of like a, um, is, you know, mm. the result of colonization and colonialism. Um, so can you speak to your relationship even historically or even currently to, to colonialism and colonization and how it played out in, in your territory, your family system? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Big one. It's been it's been a journey, and I'm I'm pretty sure my kind of views will continue to shift as I continue to experience, you know, the world. Um, but if I was to speak on it from how I saw my my fam family, my my father's family specifically, I'm a lot closer to that side than I am with my mother's. There's a lot of um, violence. It's a lot of violence, a lot of alcohol, drug, and my mum did a lot to try and shelter me from that that those types of things. But when it's all tied into a family and people with love and caring, and then we have beautiful whānau get-togethers and kai like eating together and all of that, mm -hmm. but then there's this this really dark undercurrent mm -hmm. of all of this abuse. Yeah. And I feel this would be a very similar conversation that we could have with indigenous people, grassroots indigenous people in the Americas who are from the reservation or the reserve or have a history of having to contend with settler colonialism and colonial violence. Um, you know, toxicity exists here in our family systems also. And it's really interesting and illuminating that you, you bring up this aspect of the colonial conversation because i do know that a lot of us are grappling with the toxicity that exists in our families and our communities and interestingly enough i did have a conversation with one of our patreon subscribers who is a listener and they said they want to hear a bit more of the lived experiences of of being indigenous in terms of you know the community and familial aspects and how to navigate it and it's really interesting for you on the other side of the world, identify this relationship with colonialism through the conversation you're having about your family. And yeah, it's, it's causing me to reflect on certain aspects, uh, especially now as an adult. So I guess I would ask the question is, is when do you, when did you become to realize, you know, this relationship to colonialism and the impacts it's had on your family? It's, it's not until, I was older, which I understood why why my mum pretty much took me away from that environment for her safety, my safety, and, and you know, in that situation. When I was younger, I just didn't understand. I was, why would you take me away from my family? Um, and, a, you know, a bit of animosity, I guess, towards my mum for, for doing these types of things. But um, once you, once I got older and I under started understanding why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we did have a previous conversation where you did start to identify that a lot of this has to do with colonialism in a very even like religious structural sense. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship to religion then in terms of your family experience and your colonial history? Uh, I, put down religion like I I personally I blame religion um for the effects like that's basically how I see things was their gateway into um our people um to me it was just uh, it was strongly brainwashing for our people we had our systems we had our beliefs mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And prior to, our, our people wouldn't even raise a hand to a child, to a female, to to anyone. And, you know, all of it came down to, of course, there were tribal warfare and it always comes down to territories. But like 
how there is domestic violence now and I believe it was all introduced uh alcoholism all of it <laughs> I believe it was all introduced to our people our people didn't originally um mm -hmm. have these types of ways about us yeah and I like how you're bringing up the conversation around like the familial system, the family system, uh, parent to child and partner to partner. What about in terms of like society and the bigger conversation around the political social landscape? And so, I mean, going back to looking at that, there's just so much displacement, displacement from your, your land, from least we had the Tohunga Suppression Act which banned all practices and that was that lasted for I think like 60 years so that's like two basically three generations and that's pretty much as long as it took to almost wipe out our language well yeah um, you see now that the only reason why they they put this Tohunga Suppression Act in play was because they could see how powerful our people were mm, yeah um, yeah. And this is very similar to our colonial history around the Indian Act that outlawed our ability to practice our culture, our ceremonies, um, outlawed our ability to travel and be mobile in our traditional territories. And obviously, you know, my understanding of colonialism is that these existed. These things did exist, you know, in other people's territories around the world. And you obviously knowing this history. But I feel like it might be a surprise to some of our audience who view the Maori in your territory as having their shit together, you know, having your language and your cultural practices being very strong, like it visually looks very strong. But to hear that there was an also an act in place that outlawed a lot of your cultural ceremonies and practices, it's, it's really interesting to hear this aspect of your history. Yeah, it was hugely, um, it almost took out all of our most ancient practices. Um, and these are, these are like rongoa, all of our medicines, all of you know, our arts and crafts. We didn't have a written language. So our language was passed on through the arts, through our fakairo, all of our carvings, all of our weaving, um, our chants, our songs, our haka all of those types of things and so all of a sudden you're not allowed to practice this or teach these um things and for me you know that it's all tied in with the same thing the colonizers not feeling comfortable because they don't understand it and they could see that this is something that is uh that was strong with our people and you know with the war that came through mm -hmm. all of the different wars that came through it was kind of like well if they couldn't take us out with warfare we're going to implement a system that individualizes everyone yeah and i love how you brought that up like this word individualism is like a word that encompasses a lot because i feel like indigenous people all over the world do recognize the reality that our collective ability to organize maintain who we are and survive and thrive together has been greatly disrupted by colonialism uh, historically and is still being disrupted by capitalism and by like neoliberalism you know some of our political episodes we do talk about these things but f to hear you specifically state it that way I love it. Like, I love to hear it. And it makes so much sense how you're explaining it from your perspective. One of my kayako, one of my teacher's mentors, he used to always say this, yeah, it was in, an individualism, in divide you all. And our people, you're all in, you know, First Nations peoples are always stronger with numbers. We, we crumble when we have to do things on our own. That's why whānau and family yeah. is so important our hapu, our tribes. And so, yeah, for me, that's how I saw it. saw it. They couldn't take wipe us out all in warfare. And so they implemented a system um, that would cause us to turn on each other um, and pull each other from the inside out. And it's all still systematic to this day. Mm, yeah. Yeah, you're really hitting it home, even uh, analyzing it and looking at it from the systemic perspective and the systemic lens that this project and this approach still exists and is ongoing, uh, not only in your territory, 
by the sounds of it, but also in our territory. And we literally do episodes and podcasts where we discuss settler colonialism, colonization, and ultimately even decolonization. So to hear you talk this way and explain these things, um, I'm assuming without having listened to an episode, um, is basically, you know, validating to, to me as a producer of this podcast and, and having listeners that, yeah, we, we are on point with what we say, like we know what we mean. And you hitting this home um, makes a lot of sense. And I really appreciate you doing that. You sharing your awarenesses and your insights and your history, all very illuminating and validating. Yeah, for like I said, for me, it's um, religion was the opening the gates to all of that. For, that's how I see it anyway. I mean, there's a lot of people that see things differently, but that's how it was. Um, that's how it is for me. And I'm you know, I'm still open to hearing different positions, but um, yeah, so far no one's been able to kind of shift <laughs> my views on that one. Yeah, well, it's um, badass. It's it's legitimate in my mind, and I really appreciate you saying it because it does correlate to here also. Definitely a similar colonial history here in my territory, Treaty 6 territory, Saskatchewan area. And I, I also did look that you were in Manitoba, so that's the next province over when you're traveling. Um but yeah, the residential school system in Canada, you know, wreaked havoc on our family systems. Intergenerational trauma plays out. Mm. Still a lot of alcohol and drug addiction. But how you're explaining things, too, is really unique because very similar belief systems around maintaining who we are in the face of ongoing colonization and colonialism. And and uh, that's pretty cool because we're an ocean apart, right? <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh it's really cool, and I, and I think our listeners would really um, enjoy hearing that perspective coming at uh, things from your location, your experience, your history. And again, I mean, like, the the, uh, the irony is that we do have this relationship with the British, both of us. Um, and yeah, there were assholes when it <laughs> boiled down to it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we're sort of navigating now our way through that. <clears throat> so yeah, I really love how you're positioning it and speaking to it, uh, your experience and everything there. Um What's, what's unique, though, I guess I could tie it into, you know, some of the topic questions. Um, what's unique, though, is that you're so let's position it this way. You, you, you're famous in North America in some audiences, like in some communities and some people who love film uh, for your character Chardonnay on uh, Taika Waititi's <laughs> yeah. Boy. Right. That was the first time I saw you. And I remember Taika came to our campus in New Mexico. I went to an arts college, the Institute of American Indian Arts. We call it IAIA in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I met him and he screened Boy. And that was the first time I saw it. And, and I love that film because it was like at that time he was doing something really unique. We were sort of flipping these scripts on 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 its head around you know uh family dynamics mm. you know around um you know what, what we just talked about around colonialism and the references he had in that film um even his recent film hunt for wilder people sort of has uh nuances around child welfare systems around the history mm. of colonialism um so doing a lot in that sense um but you're technically in that regard an actress to a lot of people who would be listening to this episode right now <laughs> um so you but you do a lot <laughs> you do a lot when i was researching you like uncovering what you were doing um so let, let's swing into that conversation tell our audience what you do yeah cool um oh man it's hard to kind of put it all into one paragraph let's put it <laughs> that way um i guess the easiest way is to kind of like start from maybe boy and then and then i'll lead up to here if it's cool um, yeah, so I was, I was 13 when I was cast in, in, in Boy, and that process was pretty, pretty random. My mum is in, um, education, and so she received an email that they were just doing these open casting to anyone. They were really looking for new talent. They weren't keen to kind of regurgitate, obviously if a couple, but they were really keen to get fresh talent that no one had really seen before. So they um, um, went up and down the country finding new um, talent for boy. Yeah, and it, it literally just showed up in your mom and, well, your mom's lap, right? My mom got an email. She said, hey, I just read this character. Sounds like you. We're going to Fakatane and there's like a seven hour drive from here. <laughs> yeah. So that was me and my mom in the weekend, jumped in the car, shot down, did this uh, audition. Um, and then we didn't hear back for a long time. They, ha they had some issues with funding. And so it kind of it took a, a, 
it took a while for it to get um fully green lit later i got a phone call and they asked me to come up to auckland to do a callback and so i did that um, they were going to travel me up, but I was like, oh, I actually already live here. We traveled down for the, the uh, you know, the initial one. Uh, so <laughs> nice. I came up to Auckland, yeah. did a call back, uh, met a couple of people there. Um, then they called me back again and they're like, oh, we need the people want to do some measurements. But I hadn't been told that I had landed it yet or anything. And that's when I met Taika. He came into the, the audition room and like it kind of seemed like things were happening, but I hadn't been told. And I was like, who knows, you know, so close, but so far. Uh, and then, yeah, my mom just picked me up from school one day. It was probably like a week later. And then she's like, you got the part. Like they just told me today. And so you fly out tomorrow um, down to the East Coast. Um, and we, yeah, we shot that whole lot of Māori on the, on the East Coast, playing with rocks on the side of the road. There was no way any of us thought that it was going to be yeah. what it turned out to be, nice. um, which was pretty crazy. Yeah, crazy in the sense that, you know, your mom got this email, you got the part, you did the filming, but then at the same time, you kind of became this public figure now, right, at the young age of 13. And very recognizable, obviously, because of the film. What was that like? You know, we'd have visitors to New Zealand and I'd have people like following me in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the store. Like I not even realized that people were following me to the, but asking for, you know, my photo and my, my <laughs> autograph and stuff. I was like 14 at that point. I didn't even yeah. have a signature. So I just like kind of scribble <laughs> on people's papers. Every, it was always different. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, was too, uh, it took a while for me to actually like, I need to be consistent with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you have like the kid autograph out there of you when you were younger. It's a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what happened then? What What was next? But yeah, so that that was that was thirteen, fourteen, um, and then unfortunately, um, I went through like with New Zealand's got this terrible sort of tall poppy syndrome thing that we have going on over here. So mm. as soon as that came up, it was pretty hard in school. Yeah, and this was like an aspect that I had no idea we were going to get into, but um, it kind of came across as shocking. But then at the same time, it does exist over here too. We did do some episodes and conversations on this in the past. So explain it in your words. What took place after you got selected to do this amazing film, um, get your image out there, and then return back into... Well, your school environment, right? Your school environment amongst your peers. People say bullying, but it was more like being iced out. That's how I could mm -hmm. kind of put it. Um, and it's not something that you could kind of confront uh, because mm -hmm. then you're making things up and you're this crazy person. No, no, nothing, nothing like that. Um, so that was quite hard. Um, I actually ended up moving schools, um, high schools because of it wow. um, and after that I found a school that was a lot more supportive in the arts which was awesome um, there were a lot of musicians um, and like actors and musician children that were attending mm -hmm. the school and it was just way more like chill like it was normal it wasn't this big thing so um, that decision to move pretty much saved me I feel as a person yeah, so I'm curious, like, what was the dynamic that unfolded, you know, you getting this very cool part where, you know, people should ideally support you, but they didn't. What were the specific dynamics that unfolded? Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, looking back, it was definitely coming from a place of jealousy. Um, I went to an all-girls school, um, and so I, I feel like what I know now about energies, it was just, you know, top heavy with that feminine energy and there was nothing really to balance it out. And so when I was filming, I everyone was kind of creating their friendship groups. Um, and while I was away filming, those were all being solidified. And then when I returned, it was kind of like, who even are you? And, and it was all new for me because I'd always been friends just with everyone. I was always in like the touch teams the netball teams I was into theater and I just kind of got along with everyone in primary and intermediate um, and so this kind of new phase of 
dealing with people who just don't want to have anything to do with you, making up lies about about you. And it was kind of overwhelming to the point where you're so young and naive that you just ended up believing everything that was kind of going around. I mean, high school's hard enough as it is. And then add on this like spotlight of attention of being in a feature film that go just completely blows up. Uh, yeah, it was a lot. Um, and so it, it just got so bad to the point where I was purposely getting um, missed out and my mum ended up having to come into the school and speaking to the like the principal and the teachers about some of the things that had gone down. It was it was pretty bad. Yeah. And this is interesting. Like I never would have figured that we would even be having this conversation. Um, because yeah, like lateral violence, bullying, gossip and this type of behavior, it seems pretty common in like oppressed people who have been dealing with colonialism in general. Um, but it exists in all facets of society. Um, I guess like the question would be at the age you were, how did you process doing this film and then having to go back into the real world, having to go back to school? Um, and I just, you know, I didn't even want to tell my, my school when I landed it because I was scared about what was going to happen, uh, the reactions from the girls. Um, but mum was like, what are we going to tell him? You're sick for three months. <laughs> And I was like, I don't know, but yeah, so it was a, it was a fear right from the get go. Um, and pretty much what I was nervous about all came like true after that. Um, and I'd had enough and I just wanted to be out of that environment. Um, and so my mum was like, yeah, no, I'm, she was done with it as well. She f tried to kind of work with me for a while to kind of, cause she had this idea that it was like this prestigious school and all of that. So she really wanted me to stay there. And I was like, I don't care about any of it. I'm just so not me here. Um, but yeah, so that was that. Yeah. So you, you experienced this bullying then as a result of that. Like I never would have guessed this is news to me. Like this is pretty unique to hear about. And the, the reason too is because we had another episode with um, Ashley Calling Bull who won uh, Miss Universe Canada uh, beauty pageant and very similar circumstance where she's been bullied online been bullied um in particular in this case by like indigenous males online who are like you know openly calling her out and, and making fun of her but yeah that's really unfortunate to hear like because this wasn't even on the questions was to, to, to talk about bullying but it, it does seem like it was very real for you in terms of you having this unique opportunity to represent your people um to be on the big screen do a really cool film that you know highlights um indigenous community and then you know having to go back into the the modern world and experience what you experienced yeah and i mean i really just like the term like oh you were bullied because mm -hmm. i guess in my mind bullying is like you know like grabbing you like beating you mm. up or uh, you know all of these types of things i mean this whole like mental emotional bullying like back then wasn't even a thing like mm. at all um we acknowledge it now as being very real mental, emotional abuse and online abuse and all of that kind of stuff. But this, that hadn't, we hadn't met that, got, got into that phase back then. So for me, it was like, it's not even bullying because no one's beating me up. <laughs> um, but it was, yeah, it was the kind that um, was just ostracizing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, it's, it's probably the worst feeling uh, being, being somewhere where you know you're not wanted it was horrible yeah so what was your plan like when you had enough what did you do um where did you go yeah I just had enough and moved to a school uh, a new school and it was dope like it was so good I loved school after that it was friends back it was back to like being my normal self I was friends with everyone else and yeah it was just normal it was kind of like oh yeah she's yeah, that's that's our bro, Chardonnay. <laughs> yeah, Chardonnay. <laughs> you know, they actually got told. I got told this afterwards, but um, I didn't know that the form teacher or like the principal of the Rumaki, the um, unit, actually spoke to the whole like Maori unit, mm -hmm. and they said no one's allowed to call her Chardonnay, <laughs> and if you do, you get detention. And I had no idea about any of this, yeah. so obviously they were all pretty excited as well. But they were all like, 
you know oh we're not allowed to like make this a thing yeah um and it, w- it wasn't till later after like i had you know i was comfortable and i knew people and all of that and then they started all like cracking the jokes and mm-hmm. things like that but yeah i guess so it makes sense with the experience of your previous school yeah it was i mean i i'm grateful that yeah. they took it seriously that they acknowledged you know the basic trauma that i'd just been through and they they wanted to show you know m- me and my mum yeah. that they you know, really wanted to make sure that I felt comfortable with this new transition into the school. So, yeah, yeah that's, um, it was awesome that they were able to do that. Yeah, so you completed Filming Boy. You had to go back into high school. How did you, like, progress in your career as an actress at that time? Like, what, what came next and, and where did you go from there? I think, like, oh, straight off the bat, it was a, at the premiere of Boy there were a few casting agents at the premiere and they were like talking to me straight away. I did a, a feature like straight off the bat after Boy because it was like, you know, I was on a wave and people were just trying to jump on it. So I did that straight after. And then all of the intense stuff started happening with the response from like the girls at my previous school. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So you filmed Boy, you're at the premiere and you agreed to do another production, but then you went back to school and experienced the social chaos that came from you being in the spotlight and after that I was like this is my last gig I don't want to have anything to do with this this world if this is what I have to put up with and so I was like a base like mental note wow I quit I quit this industry like I was done Mm. um and so I was you know I was 15 I think by then and so I was just wanting to I just wanted to fit in (laughs) I wanted to fit in and I wanted to do what every everyone else was doing um in school and that was kapaka. So kapaka and school um, and dance was another passion of mine. And so, yeah, finished school, went into like kapaka nationals and all of that, which was pretty much it runs your life when you're at high school and you do kapaka. It's like you study, study. And then from like Friday to Sunday, you're practicing at school at the marae, ready for the next competition sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that was my sort of high school, graduated. Um, and then I went overseas for a year to Argentina and I studied there for a bit, um, the language and dance over there. Wow. So like, how do you go from, you know, doing a full, you know, feature film that's really popular to high school to doing your traditional performances and cultural practices on stage and then making the jump to Argentina. <laughs> it was basically, I wasn't 100% sure on what I wanted to do with my life. And I had a lot of older mates that I'd kind of observed them taking paper, then dropping that paper, then jumping to a next, another paper, and then another paper, um, dropping out, um, going back. And to me, it just looked like a lot of wasted not just money but time like you can't get time back and you know me watching them do this I was just like wow I am not going to go to university doing something that I've just been encouraged to do because it's the right thing to do yeah that's very valid very valid assessment and argument to make in terms of university um in context to the constant paper writing we're doing like the constant writing as a form of like proving your knowledge I feel like the term paper is coming into question. Like people are starting to question it as a valid um, question, whether or not it's a valid way of measuring uh, like student competency or student intellect. Um, So a very valid argument there that you're making, especially in terms of cost. Uh, Complete disclaimer, I am in university. (laughs) I do work in the university system. I'm technically an instructor. Um, But you went to Argentina. You went to Argentina. So, uh, instead of going to university, you decided to travel, go to Argentina. Why Argentina? I'd always had a thing about um, like the lang- like of language, Spanish anyway. And so I looked at Mexico and Spain and I looked at lots of different places. Um, but the program that I did, the timing just worked well for um, Argentina and they speak Spanish over there as well. Um, so I was like, cool, like, let's do that. Yeah, that's valid. That's very valid. I always tell young people to travel to. Um, it's an education process in itself, for real. 
it's funny you go all the way over overseas to learn about yourself <laughs> but it's uh, it's it seriously it, that's how it happens um yeah totally and i i just really kind of highlighted the values that we have here like with my own upbringing and culture being over there was like just with our elders the way that we treat our elders here that was really highlighted because it was a little bit different over there how our connection with the land how we treat it and all of that you know all of that those types of things just really small but big things uh, for me um and so yeah that was like an amazing experience my family over there were beautiful they didn't want me to go back to New Zealand they wanted me to stay and so yeah I just had this huge like you know worldly sort of experience um that kind of reassured more of the things that I love and valued and believed in. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came back, I, I kind of had a little bit more of an idea of, you know, the field that I wanted to kind of explore. So tell us about you coming back then, because doing the research on you, you jumped in a TV series, a TV series where you were on, well, I'll say it in English, you were on like a ocean voyaging canoe for a TV series and they were recording your experience there. So you went to Argentina and then you came back and you did this series. Um, can you tell us about that experience? Because uh, it is pretty unique to do that type of uh, show also. Yeah. <laughs> me being me I always kind of just jump at opportunities I ended up jumping on this waka haurua so if you can imagine Moana Disney was basically like that but bigger so there's 16 people that can sleep aboard on our waka haurua traveled around New Zealand Aotearoa the North Island for about eight weeks um, and so being away from my whenua for like a whole year and then coming back and then being able to look, yeah. be on the moana and look at my whenua from that kind of view. Yeah, yeah. And and for our listeners who aren't aware, it like uh, whenua meaning like your land, right? Like your territory, your land coming at it and looking at it from, from the ocean. What, what was that like? <laughs> like to see this view that obviously is pretty ancestral. It was kind of was trippy. Like I was looking at it from how our tupuna would have seen our land from the first time and yeah. it was like I was returning back home exactly how they would have yeah so yeah that was like that was a pretty crazy experience um and during that time our our kayako kayako and like rangatira tohunga basically like our um our leader our it's a better way to it's like not shaman but kind of you know that sort of level he um, taught a little bit about celestial navigation, um, which was mind blowing. Uh, and so we would get kind of put on little courses of navigating our our waka and using the stars to get us to our next destination. So that was, again, a crazy um, experience that I'll never forget. That was actually documented, that whole process, even though I said that I was like quitting the industry. <laughs> When I came back, that it kind of like came back without me even trying. And so the producer of that, um, like docu series sort of thing, um, she was like, Babe, like, what are you doing now? I know about this project that's happening and I think you'd be really great for one of the characters. Um, and so even though I said that I, I, I was done with the industry, it kind of like just did a whole 360. And then I ended up doing a series um, after that, landed a role um, in a series called This Is Picky. Um, and it was filmed down in Rotorua. Yeah, yeah. And we'll link that in the show notes so people can see the work you've done on the screen. But yeah, a full 180. Yeah, ended up going back to the industry. And I had a great time with that. And I, you know, I was older. Um, I knew myself better. And I was more confident with myself. Just having that bit of time to grow and learn and live a bit more, I think, was it just did everything for me. 
Yeah, so you got to go back to the big screen, and then you begin to take this shift into theater. Can you tell us how that unfolded? One of my co-stars, I guess you'd call him, he was also involved with a, a company called Hawaii 2, um, which is a, um, a haka theater company, which is really um, like a new sort of thing for back, like this was 2015, 16. And so it was a, a fusion of um, the, like theatre, um, haka, and singing and contemporary dance. So it was it was kind of like a fusion of my, all my different worlds in, in a sense because yeah. um, when I was younger, dance was my world, it, ballet, hip, pop, jazz, tap, everything. Um, but I was always like the only Māori girl in a white class. <laughs> so it was kind of not a thing to do if you're a Māori person to do all these, you know, extracurricular activities that is like ballet. And that was a white thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but there's a place for it, right? So all these things merge for you to do this theatre company and get into theatre. If I met this company, it was like, wow, this is super cool. This is like literally all the different sides of me in a, in a company. So, um yeah it was it was wicked uh so i jumped jumped in auditioned for that company and then ended up um being with them i'm still actually technically still part of the whanau there so i toured and did a couple of shows with them and then i did an, another another few gigs and with short film and theater yeah but it was the theater that that brought you to canada right like we're going to get into your experience of coming to here to our part of the world in terms of what you experienced and observed. Um, but tell us about how that unfolded in terms of how this theater company, or I guess your relationship to theater, ultimately led you to coming here to where we're at. I think 2018 uh, was when I had met another person who was kind of in, in the space um, and they had had someone that had dropped out of their their group when they were planning to head to Canada to do um, a bit of a tour um, which was crazy crazy I mean I don't know why but Canada had never been on like my radar I didn't have like wicked aspirations to go over there. I don't know why. I just didn't see it that way. And then when I got there, it was completely, totally different to what I had <laughs> like, you know, made up in my mind. <laughs> and um, my friend had obviously given me the lowdown of where we were going. So mm -hmm. we first were going to um, was Winnipeg and Toronto. And then we went up to Ihalui up in the Arctic down to Ottawa and then we went to Vancouver, Vancouver Island, Haida Gwaii. Yeah, there was those are kind of like the main sort of places. We did do a couple of tiki tours ourselves while we're, you know, just to local places while we're at certain cities. Yeah, and and we did discuss that there was some key things that took place here that uh you're willing to speak to and give us an understanding of from your perspective as somebody coming to Canada for the first time yeah that was um that ended up being such a life-changing experience for us um you know made connections that we still have today that you know such good friends um and on like such a spiritual level yeah can you give us an example of sort of how you know this spiritual connection emerged how um you had these moments that were pivotal to your experience here one of the most like hard-hitting moments for me was when we we went to the arctic and some of our protocols when we first arrive in newlands we have to um we have to be welcomed there like to feel okay spiritually um and so when we landed there um and because it would naturally sort of happen anyway when we were part of the festivals they would go kind of through that process but this one time there, there wasn't that up there and we asked for one of the, like the festival managers where we said oh is is there any like sort of um elders sort of home in the, in this area because we would just like love to go um and meet them and explain why we're here and 
and for us basically ask permission to to be here and do what we had intended like we want to explain what we're wanting to do and they were like oh sorry um yeah okay sure I'll, I'll sort that out yeah of course there is and so then we went there and um there were probably about let's say about 20 um elders in this this like whatever this house that we went to um and uh, n- they all didn't speak english um and so we had translators with us um and so yeah we just went there and um it explained why we were there um and the intentions that we had like to share what we know and uh, w- with our workshops and things like that but of course we said like this is your land and these are your people um and if you don't feel comfortable with doing this like of course we won't put this on anyone but this is what we are here to do and um and then that was like all like being translated and so the anticipation <laughs> and was just like crazy <laughs> And then one yeah. by one, um, the elders just all started and really elderly as well. So we didn't want them to mm. like, you know, go out of their way. But one by one, they all stood up um, and like nodded their head and agreed wow. that we could be there and do what we wanted mm-hmm. to do. And it was just like, wow, I was in tears. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was, uh, you know, just going through that process. Um, and I think for them, they were you know, they acknowledge us for doing that, you know, going to ask them. Uh, so that was, that was really beautiful. Yeah. And even, I mean, I got to experience that too, going to Hawaii and uh, with my Kanaka Maoli friends in terms of that process, that's very similar to yours because you're obviously related. Um, that's really cool that it unfolded like that because I don't know an indigenous people who would um, refuse to do that because I feel like everywhere we go, we love to welcome people and we love to meet on that more spiritual, deeper, respectful ground with one another. And I said in the podcast before too, I, I don't go where I'm not invited or formally invited to. So I practice that even personally as someone who likes to travel is I'll only go where, you know, I have friends and family or people who, you know, claim me as friends and family because traveling so much more meaningful that way. Um, so yeah, if our listeners, you know, they should know by now that we were kind of critical of tourism too. Um, so it's really cool that you did operate from that place of, you know, making those deeper connections. Um, I have a question about Canada. So what alarmed you about Canada? Um, what did, what was your experience like in terms of, you know, not realizing or observing, you know, society here? Um, something that, you know, impacted you in that way. It was quite, um, the first place that we landed was Winnipeg, actually. And um, because I had sort of jumped into the saying, yes, I was in rehearsal mode, learning all of the, you know, all of everything that we needed to do to put on this this show and these workshops. So I didn't really have time to research. I just kind of trusted, you know, the person who was organizing it. And um, I just focused on what I was, you know, being hired to do, which was deliver the performance yeah. um and so when we first arrived into winnipeg there was a kind of festival opening like drinks networking get together sort of thing and so we went there mm-hmm. i was kind of like where are all the like where are all the first nations people like i thought this was yeah. a you know and i was yeah. i was kind of like ah, i mean this is nice hi cool but I, I was like it wasn't my jam and so i was just like yeah let's go you know and so we lasted there for like 45 minutes or something we met um this one group of people were like the first first nations people that we saw and we just like gravitated towards them like straight away because we were all like (laughs) yeah that people that might get us they're gonna have to get us (laughs) yeah like feeling such like a fish out of water over here (laughs) uh and yeah and we just started like it was crazy they had just finished they were basketball players and they had just finished competing in a kiorahi competition wow. which is like it's a maori game and so we were like wow. how are we here and you guys <laughs> have just done this we were just like what? wow yeah it yeah. was crazy um <laughs> and so yeah that was that was really a really cool like first interaction um yeah it's it's pretty cool when those synchronicities happen like 
I would take that as a good sign in general. Um, you know, meeting people, meeting good people, connecting on that deeper level, uh, and that weird, you know, uh, sign that sort of emerged in, in the conversation that they, they were doing, uh, a Marty game. Um, so let's talk about Winnipeg then, because I do know that you had social interactions or social observances around, you know, oppression, colonialism, and, you know, some of the chaos that does exist here. I was really overwhelmed by, um, all of, like what I was seeing and it was so many people that were like walking around the park like and you know First Nations peoples just really wasted and like you know it was clear that drugs and alcohol were was like yeah. rife I don't know if it was just that specific day or that area because I didn't know it and and like queer komatua so elders that were in this sort of state and it was like mm. just mm -hmm. so upsetting like I just found myself in a really vulnerable situation and I kind of I almost like broke down because it was really hard hitting for me to see the state of even though they're not my people I felt like they were my people you know um yeah and I was just so upset I was uh, you know um, my friend ended up like we ended we ended up having to go back to our accommodation to have something to eat just to kind of ground our, ourselves again. Yeah, and and what stood out to me when you brought this up is how you said that they're your people, like you feel like they are your people, and I think that's true. I feel that is true for a lot of Indigenous people when we meet one another and see one another that we do get this like sense of. Uh, relationship and kin um but winnipeg manitoba too i mean it, it it does have a unique geographical position of being one of the biggest urban centers in the province so um a lot of you know our people tend to make their way there um and and live in the inner city um but i also appreciate you bringing this up because this was your first experience one of your first experiences with coming to canada like coming to this settler state that is supposed to be first world right and and how it seems so normalized in in the urban centers that you know the street people who are our people who are likely residential school survivors who are likely people who are dealing with uh trauma that stems from colonialism and oppression are there and um it, i feel like that's becoming normalized and it, it should not be yeah it was just i mean coming over here you, you see things on facebook you see things on the news and like what's going down and you know it's upsetting and whatnot but when it's in your face like you can't look away well i guess some people do look away uh, yeah it was a lot but then fortunately the next place that we went to it was like cam loop sort of area we went to do a performance at a lodge and the mana whenua there the first nations peoples in that area they had like a lot of say over you know what happened and they were showing they showed us um some of their smoke houses and um how they would traditionally cook like salmon and um showed us you know a lot of different places on the land and so it was like i went from like one extreme to the to the other yeah. Yeah. And those extremes do exist, right? They do exist in, in terms of Canada, but also, you know, the United States, right? They, they exist and they're out there and, and you got to observe, you know, those two very real um, lives that, that are out there in, in this country. Yeah. I mean, although it was upsetting, it was very real, um, you know, to get an understanding of the landscape of how things are. Yeah. Yeah bit of a tangent but um <laughs> no no this is really good content um and it's really cool that you got to come here and see you know uh like north america like canada uh for lack of a better word but yeah a lot of people here right a lot of different languages and different territories on on even you know overlapping one another um and then yeah like you speaking to the social issues that you witnessed very real like houselessness is very real in our in our urban centers and um very vast territories so you saw winnipeg you saw the north you saw uh kamloops area you went up to the west coast um so yeah it's a it's a, it's a big island right yeah. Turtle Island's a, a pretty big island <laughs> totally the landscape is quite similar actually to like our here more of the south island but it's just like times 
50. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember we, when we were tr- when we were driving, because um, most of the time we would just fly everywhere. But every now and then, when we when we, if we'd have a couple of days off, we'd hire a car and then just drive. And uh, I remember we'd come up to one mountain range and I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, I don't want to fall asleep. Like I'm going to miss it because that's kind of what happens here." <laughs> yeah go to sleep wake up go to sleep <laughs> oh it's still there like it was just it was enormous. it was amazing it was so stunning um yeah yeah it was beautiful yeah that's pretty yeah i never really actually thought about it like that that it would be con- like a condensed version of an island right in where you're <laughs> yeah. at compared to this big one here yeah it's really cool it's really cool to have this conversation and hear you hear you speak to it and put words to it um i got a question so you were here doing like this theater and you said that this theater approach really embodied all these aspects of you um when i was doing research on it, it they they find it as like a um, um like you're doing haka workshops and and a theater approach to you know uh, representing your culture and who you are um over here people tend to recognize the haka like it's popular obviously through you know like the all blacks but also through sports um and so it's, it's one of those things that you know just tend to attract our people's eye and um associate with with your people down there um can you explain it or like give us some context and perspective um from from who you are yeah um so haka for us is, is utilized for m- many different things nowadays uh traditionally it would would have been performed you know, prior to heading into tr- tribal warfare and it's a lot of it is to do with collectively all getting onto the same frequency to work together basically as well as you know raising vibrations ra- raising energy which is required for what they're about to do and so in that sense that's all still the same obviously we have um, competitions and things because it is an art form that we are holding you know holding tight to and, and ensuring that this is never lost and in terms of like sports and things like that that in a sense is going going to war you know you're going to war for your team um and so that is why it's appropriate for for our teams to recite a haka prior to going to battle for you know their sport form whatever it may be they're also um sort of put together for political stances social issues that are that are happening they'll all be kind of taken into consideration and, and then the haka will, will be written to address this, the issues that are happening in, in society currently just point blank really clearly calling people out calling our own people out a lot of the time as well um yeah so there's there's though all of those sort of reasons they also perform to acknowledge uh, purely the essence of life or celebrations so you'll, so you'll see people perform haka at weddings to acknowledge this new sort of milestone for the beginning of this journey for you know to those two people they'll also be um, performed at at tangihanga at funerals um, and that's to um, give acknowledgement and celebrate um, their life yeah and as all things done by indigenous people in this way there, there's always more to it that you could speak to and you likely won't be able to get across in this conversation yeah so i, I mean this a, a range of um different reasons why haka performed um but for me all it, it's all of those all of the all of the above it, it's it's definitely like a stamp of our identity you know, our identity yeah we're all very proud of it and it allows you to express certain emotions and feelings that you, we're not typically allowed to do in mm, yeah. society. Mm-hmm. Like to, you know, to be in that sort of form and mm-hmm. the type of energy and, um, you know, fearsomeness that is required. You're not, you're not allowed to behave like that <laughs> in society because you're like, oh, there we go again, another angry angry maori or you know like those yeah. types of attitudes but for some reason and i put it on the all blacks because we're crazy about rugby in this country 
they've kind of opened yeah. the floodgates for that to be socially accepted here, which is like amazing. Mm. But if we if we didn't have that, yeah, I don't think it would be acknowledged the same way that it is now. Interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I really wanted to position that because I do know like a lot of my people, a lot of people here in my territory tend to associate the haka only to the all blacks or only to, you know, the the masculinity of the performance. But hearing you speak to this whole dynamic of emotion, of getting on the same frequency of the different um, spaces they're done in makes a lot of sense. Like it's clicking a lot of dots mm. for me. And I even liked how you highlighted like it allows for this emotion to be expressed, right? And, I, and in my mind, I, I feel that's why some people are attracted to the haka because you, you do see this boldness that gets to come out. You do get to see this raw emotion that gets to come out um, because obviously over here, you know, with the impact of residential school, like what you saw in terms of um, the houselessness in, in Winnipeg, inner city problems and issues, you know, there's a, there's a big um, hist- historical trauma that occurred for a lot of our people. And uh, we're starting to regain emotional intelligence. Again, I feel doing a lot of healing work, reflection on who we are, where we come from, tapping into, you know, our, our genes on that level. So yeah, like anything that's emotional tends to attract attention or scare people away. Mm. <laughs> so I think the haka does have that like power to, to be like, whoa, what is that? And it does sort of really speak to you on a deeper level, an emotional level. Yeah. And I by no means am a haka expert at all, but that, you know, that, that is, that is definitely like scratching the top of it. You could mm. talk about this for a whole other podcast. Yeah. A whole other podcast. But that, <laughs> that's kind of for me is just, you know, just mm-hmm. give, giving you the kind of all angles cool. from how I see things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess that would like bridge into the next question of like, tell us about your theater practice and like, how do you approach theater? Um, because you do have this experience of, you know, being thrusted into the big screen through, through you know, uh, Taika Waititi's film, Boy. But then you went through this phase of doing theater for a while, which is different than acting on film and acting in front of a camera. What was that like? Yeah, I did go through a phase where I... Um went into theatre for a couple of years. Theatre was a big change for me, uh, coming from screen. Any screen theatre actors listening to this will 100% understand what I'm talking about. It's also, I wasn't trained. I I didn't go to school for acting or anything like that. I just tried, gave it a go, and it happened. So I all of the, these different techniques and things and, that you would have learned in school that I wasn't aware of and just kind of like stumbled upon. <laughs> Um, you know, I didn't understand what was what, and it was just like, I just found out what worked for me and what didn't. Theatre, it challenged me greatly, and it mainly had to do with this one show that I did, Astro Man. It was based in a small, like, it was set in Whakatane, so like the small East Coast sort of town. I was playing a female character that was from there, and like a a Maori teenager, and so I was like, well, I... I am that, I'm from that. I mean, I was a little bit older then, but I was yeah. just like, you know, that is who I am. So mm-hmm. in my mind, I didn't really have to change much from that character at all. And then we had the, this like language teacher come in. It was more about projection, you know, speaking to like a full theater, but we had to go through all of like the art- articulating our words and pronunciation mm-hmm. of certain things. And so there were certain words in like our script and I was like oh yeah well this was this is how I would say it because I'm a Maori girl and then Mm -hmm. like our teacher would be like no we have to enunciate our words you know (laughs) and I was just like I strongly disagree (laughs) you know because that is not how my character would say things and so like there was just yeah it was really challenging and so I basically had to like go through it and I could tell like some of my you know the my friends that I was working with they were like gee are you all right (laughs) because I could tell that I was getting really worked up because I mean I I had this you know this white woman telling me how to be a Maori teenager from Whakatane and I I just couldn't deal with it (laughs) Mm, yeah Um, yeah uh, but I ended up getting over myself (laughs) eventually and I went through the process which was all valid it was all valid teachings but when it came to the actual character I like I went back to the way I wanted to perform her as her 
but yeah so it like theater to me previously was like it was just so ott like everything was over the top but in terms of like how you react how you were on stage just how you were having to open up constantly um and so that was a big change screen everything is very like intimate you don't have to project because you're mic'd up the camera you know captures everything from all different angles and so like you you know with things with boy there'd be a scene where I wouldn't even have to have dialogue and I just kind of react like you know like I don't know I'll just shake my head a little bit and it would just be like (laughs) yeah Chardonnay just showed up to the zoom chat right now we just saw Chardonnay (laughs) show up here (laughs) like you know it would just be a side eye side eye and a little shrug here and the camera picks it all up and you know for me it felt Mm. really natural as a, when I had to jump into theatre, all of a sudden I was like being asked to like throw my hands mm. up in the air and like big ass facials. And I was like, well, this is so not real. But it was just the way that I had, you know, I previously had seen things and what I was used to and clearly what I was comfortable with. Um, so jumping into that was like a whole new space of getting used to doing things. Yeah, so tell us about the theater that you worked with and what you did. So, yeah, I um, did theater, did legit theater with like a full on, it's Auckland Mm -hmm. um, Theater Company. It's probably the biggest theater company in in Auckland. And then I did a few things with a Maori um, theater company called Terehia. And then after that year was when I found Hawaii 2, which was more more a combination of, mm-hmm. of everything. And I and with that company, I actually did more of the dance, the, the fusion dance. Yeah. And I want to ask the question of how you went from theater in terms of being on stage in front of the crowd to doing what you're doing now, which is you're basically a producer now. You're producing um, film and content and media. So how did that work, going from stage to working in the capacity you're working in? Yeah, so all throughout like, kind of like that process, I was just noticing what happened behind the scenes a lot more. And basically noticing how much of a gap there was or there wasn't enough Māori producers and Māori female producers in, in the industry. And so I completed a short film. Oh, when was that? It must have been like 2019. And I was chatting with the DOP, the cinematographer at the um at the rap party and he was like oh so Ricky what's your next project that you're jumping on and me at that time I didn't really have a plan (laughs) it was more kind of like go where it feels good and whatever opportunity pops Mm -hmm. up still sort of working out you know what I wanted Mm -hmm. to do and kind of just hustling from acting contract to a theater you know screen theater dance it was all like a combination of all of those things and so I was chatting with him and I said oh I've got this audition for this coming up so hopefully I'll get that but in all honesty I would I've been noticing you know behind this behind the camera shenanigans a lot more than I ever have before usually you know as an actor you just rock up get wardrobe makeup here do do your scene do what you've been paid to do and then mm-hmm. have a kai have a munch have a chit chat and then I was out of there but I had all of a sudden started like noticing a whole lot more what was going on um and so I told him I was like if I ever had the opportunity to learn production I would do it in a heartbeat fast forward six months later I was about to go on stage and then he ends up giving me a call and he was like, hey, Ricky, how's it going? I was like, yeah, I'm actually just about to jump on stage, but what's up? Because, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, he didn't call me every day. So I was, you know, quite interested. And he goes, hey, so um, I've been awarded this funding. I know this person and I think you would be great. And I was like, because he's a creator, so he doesn't really, he like talks in code, <laughs> speaks yeah, in yeah. code. So you kind of have to <laughs> connect the dots as, yeah, yeah. as he's speaking. You don't really know what he's saying <laughs> until you work it out. Um, and he was like, anyway, so uh, here's her number, give her a call. And um, I'm catching the plane to Australia now. I'll talk to you later. And I was like, <laughs> what just happened? 
with me. They're like, Ricky, you're new to that stage. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, save this number. Save it, her name. Yep, okay, cool. Jumped on stage and then did the mis- after we, we finished the show, I went down and I did the mistake of obviously Googling who this person was. I was like, global executive producer and managing director or blah, and I just completely freaked me out. I was like, what? Like, what is he thinking? Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I found her email and I gave her an email and tried to articulate what, um, his name's Fred, Fred Inata, what he was trying to explain to me. I mean, I didn't even really know what I was doing because it wasn't a hundred percent clear. Anyway, so I told, explained on this email who I knew and what he'd said to me and um, that he had this idea and that he thinks that we should meet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sent that off and then um, I didn't hear back for a little while. Fred ended up ringing me back like he'd landed and finished doing what he was doing over in Australia. He was like, hey, have you given her a call? And I'm like, oh, I just sent her an email. because oh, she's so busy. Just give her a call. It'll be faster. And I was like, all righty uh so like anxiety going <laughs> through the roof uh and i give her this cold call and i'm just like kilda hi um i'm ricky and like i was thinking she's not gonna know who you are like what are you doing and they're just like oh i've been waiting for your call and i was like what <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was like no way okay um, oh, nice. And then so we had a quick chat and then she's like, why don't you come into the office next week? Let's make, come, you know, and let's talk about what this, what, what we're going to do. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. I ended up meeting, um, meeting with Charlene at their office in, in the city. It was like a very bougie office. Like, not going to lie. I was like, whoa, this is like fancy, fancy. And yeah. <laughs> I was like, they walked in and, you know, not seeing anyone that looks like me apart from her and I was just like new space new space but let's go you know and so we started um, chatting so she said oh so I understand you're interested in learning about production and I was like yes (laughs) I have no experience in it but I am interested in learning if uh yeah, yeah basically if you're willing to have me shadow you um and then she was like so what do you think is the most important thing about producing and here's me, like, no idea about what <laughs> you actually do. I just yeah. knew that they were a person that works, you know, as a director and a producer, and yeah. I don't. I knew they worked together, and I knew that they kind of called shots, basically. That was yeah. my overall understanding of what a producer does. <laughs> um, and so I said, um, what's the most important thing about producing? And I was like, well, to be honest, um, Kai, like, food, because... <laughs> You know, you can't work with anyone if they're hangry. <laughs> she just started pissing herself, laughing. She's like, I completely agree. And I, and then I, and I was kind of like catching myself out as I was saying, I was like, what are you doing? Why don't you say something smart? And then I was just like, yeah. Well, and then I was trying to like justify it. And I was like, because, you know, like manaki tanga with our people, like like t- taking care of people is such a big, you know, thing for us. So for me, that's that's it is food. And that's how I look after people. And that's yeah. how I care mm. for people. Yeah. And she was like, I completely agree. I'm I'm Cook Island. I'm from um, Achu. Um, and we're exactly the same. That's how, you know, or she wasn't. Well, I guess it's debatable because Cook Islands, everyone says that that's just another link of <laughs> Maori mm-hmm. sort of um, mm-hmm. connections. But yeah, so she's like, that's the same for our people. We just, you know, it's just food, food, food. And that's how you show that you care for people and look after them. She was like, yeah. so yeah, I mean, this is the greatest answer I've ever had. She's like, people usually say like budgets and spreadsheets, but I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you're on the road to become a producer. Yeah, finally, yeah, crazy enough that that meeting went well and she said, let's do like a two-month placement. See, it might not be what you expect, even though I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was just kind of like, yeah, let's go. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And we'll go from there. So did a two-month placement with this um, really successful commercials producer and she runs the company, so um, businesswoman. Mm -hmm super savvy you know just and and beautiful generous person as Mm -hmm. you know as a human and so 
as she was teaching me the ropes of production, she was crossing from commercials into long form, so television and film, which is where I'd mm, come from. Yeah. So although she was teaching me the ropes, I was also able to bring something to the table, which felt really good because, um, you know, you just like to be able to offer something um, instead of it being one-sided. So it was just a really awesome relationship and I was able to um, introduce her to a lot of other producers from from film and television as well as I didn't even realise at the time, but I knew a whole lot of um, television commissioners and film commissioners from like my background of being in Kura um, and my mum being in education, a lot of their kids, my mum had taught their kids um, and I had gone to school with a lot of them or I or I had worked with them as an as an actor and they would be my producer or director kind of I was able you know to bring something uh, to the table as well as being a sponge <laughs> learning from her so yeah that is uh, after that two-month placement she was like wow I'm absolutely loving this I'm it's working well for me um, and then offered me a full-time mm-hmm. position with the company and I've been with them ever since wow. uh, and it's yeah that's yeah it, yeah it's it's cool it's a cool story to hear of how you made this transition from obviously being you know a really thrust into stardom young star on a Taika Waititi film and then now you're working as a producer and it's basically luck of the draw this whole story that you just told um, so what has happened since then since you got that position Full time. Since then, um, I've been associate producer on a, um episode. Like it was part of a TV series, but we only did one of them, which was called Tomanu. But the series was called Beyond the Veil, and that was for TVNZ here in in New Zealand. And I ended up actually acting in it as well. I was being one of the producers. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Wasn't my idea, but the director just happened to want to go in that direction and then another series that we've produced together called the untold tales of tutera moana and that was released at the end of last year yeah we've just got a lot of projects in development um that we're working on and although it's not being in front of the camera and things like that i'm still being able to have some sort of say in a creative space and that's what i've sort of identified what I love doing it's telling stories stories that come from an authentic space for our people by our people but I'm also a strong advocate for genuine partnerships like I feel like our world has because of this the long 200 years or whatnot of colonization and um, our people you know wanting everything back and everything to be run by ourselves and for our for our people and and I I, you know I support that as well but I also believe that we need allies you know it's it's so much harder to do things on on our own and there are a lot of people out there that are willing to help us out give us a hand um, and teach us ways that you know we're so many years behind if we're going to start from scratch so why not you know if it's if it is genuine build these um, connections and relationships with people who are willing to fast track you basically so yeah I mean that's pretty much what um, we're up to now a lot of collaborations with Pacifica women men and a lot of talent that is coming out with our stories that they want to find other you know pacific and maori women to work with to tell these stories and yeah so it's um been a 190 degree angle sort of learning <laughs> it's just straight up <laughs> yeah that's it's legit though it's really cool to hear like your background and everything that got you to where you're at today and then also talking about like 
back of the house of production because we did do some episodes too where we talked about that where like we need more filmmakers Mm -hmm. and i think like over here like indian country loves when there's a brown face on the screen or like an indigenous person on the screen you know doing what they're doing but so much goes into getting that person Mm -hmm. there and so like filmmakers i talk to you know my art friends we're we're always talking about we need more writers we need more producers we need more people who could facilitate that because there's so much more that goes into a film than simply just you know finding the actor and then it's really cool to hear how you also just got the um, got the position for Boy to, to be Chardonnay because there's a big wave of that right now in North America where people are auditioning, are wanting to get into acting. And again, like no background experience, like no formal mm-hmm. training, and then being being put in those positions to, to do that. So it's a, it's a really cool story that kind of just came full circle with this conversation. <laughs> and there's some things I learned about you that I did not know that were, weren't were online when I was trying mm. to research. What I should have just, I should have just asked you directly <laughs> before, but but yeah, you, you took us there and it's really cool to, to hear where you're at as an associate producer now working for this company. Um, and yeah, working behind the scenes because that's a really important space. I think that, in my opinion, honestly, I think back of the house production, doing things um, behind the camera is it would be controversial to say but is far more important than the actor in front of the camera yeah it would be controversial to say but i would probably agree with well there's just there's so much more i mean the actors are cherry on top of the cake yeah exactly and the only reason it's like i guess it's like you know people that go to the gym but don't worry about Mm -hmm. nutrition per se it's because that's all on the outside that you kind of see and so that's what people see is like you know people yeah on the film fronting it um and on the on the carpets if it goes to a premiere you know like everyone just sees that but people don't see all of the previous fights yeah and (laughs) you know to get that person there yeah and not only that but also to have like indigenous people there like BIPOC people there people from the community people who know what they're doing behind the scenes to you know pay attention to those details those subtle details that that the film requires or that the production requires people when in um, production design like how important it is to have our you know our Maori and Pacific practitioners being the HOD of certain departments because they're the only ones that are going to understand is this uh, an appropriate uh, art form to be positioned in this place? Is this an appropriate um, action to do? Like all of these, all of these things, it all starts with the writing. So that's where I've I've really enjoyed working because I a lot of my time is within uh, development, um, developing scripts and things like that. So yeah, it's um it is definitely like that's where it all starts. Yeah, yeah, it, it is it definitely. I agree too. It's really cool. It's really cool to sit with you and have this conversation and see where you're going and where you're taking it. And also, you also highlighting the reality that we need more writers, that we need more producers, we need more creatives who are dedicating, you know, uh, time to representing our people uh, efficiently and effectively. Um, Yeah, I hope you like I hope more people have eyes on you in terms of where we're at over here watching you from across the ocean. (laughs) It's it's pretty cool. Like, no, it's nice to have reminders that that does exist. Because, you know, you get so tied up in what you're doing in your everyday life and, and the the goals and the deadlines that you're meeting here and all of that, that you do kind of forget that there are people uh, watching what what you're doing. Um, so it was, yeah, it was kind of a nice um, to hear that. Turtle Island's watching. <laughs> yeah, Turtle Island is watching and... and uh... Even for you to position yourself in terms of your landscape people, like that's really important. Like I, I'm really glad you spoke to that and demonstrated, you know, how natural that was for you to do that. Uh, because we are, again, like I said, in North America over here, um, sort of encountering people who, who are avoiding those conversations. Mm. Um, but I also want to close off with like some specific questions that are a little bit more, um, I don't know, um, some specific questions that are more, uh, a little bit more accessible, practical. You working about you talking about film, you working on film, you being in film. What's your favorite film? Ah, um, <laughs> I have like split personalities. <laughs> These questions are meant to be like number one, like spot hitting us. <laughs> um, okay, well, no pressure, no pressure. One of my favorite films is Chocolat, based in like a French town. 
it's a it's mum and her daughter and yeah and they like travel around together I loved the relationship between the mother and daughter and it, me and my mum traveled a lot when overseas and all over so that's probably one, one of them I, I can't say I've got one but I've got a couple that I also really enjoyed um <laughs> the notebook um, <laughs> nice nice you got served well yeah <laughs> um the indian horse and uh, yeah yeah um yeah. there's one that's recently uh come out from here which i think is crazy amazing good is muru um mm. and that's just been released uh, recently yeah. um and of course love boy but <laughs> it's just you know gonna be with me for life so yeah that's true that's true it's gotta, I think... it's gotta be there <laughs> yeah, it's got to be there. I th- you know, honestly, you know, some of my friends, when I was in art school, uh, we loved boys because it did sort of highlight and like even how you described it as you being these Maori kids, you know, on the side of the road throwing rocks. Like that was our <laughs> life growing up. It, it kind of it, it captures like this element of being indigenous in a community naturally. And I think that's why that's a part of like one of my favorite films is Boy. I always tell people to watch Boy because it naturally just encaps- it captures what, what we, who indigenous people are living in a community in a modern era. Yeah. And I, I think what was so special about it is like the films that had been released prior to that, you know, had kind of made it would be, I guess, Once Were Warriors, mm. Whale Rider. And the difference between like, I guess, and they're all lenses of our reality. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, people whether people want to disagree or not, it's yeah. like yes, there is, there's, there was it, an aggressive streak to our people, and then there's whale rider, which comes with m- more of a spiritual sort of lens mm-hmm. to our people, and and boy, I feel is the comedic side and yeah. to our people that hadn't really been, um, you know, it hadn't been shown in that sort of form before because mm-hmm. I, I I feel like a lot of the time they're like oh yeah Maori people are oh, they're so spiritual and they're so mm-hmm. strong and all of that and it's yeah yeah we are but we're also real funny yeah <laughs> like, we <laughs> love true. to like you know um make jokes about our mm-hmm. own people and and you know give people a hard time that's pretty much how you know you're from here as if <laughs> you give yeah. people a hard time about things that's how it is <laughs> yeah true true yeah Yeah, very similar to here too and i guess also too like reflective of the culture you grew up in uh what do you listen to like listen to in terms of music oh my gosh um a lot of like mainstream music um when i was really really little britney spears was massive um interesting yeah but as a family uh, reggae it's mm. yeah we have a huge love for reggae here so um some of our um biggest bands would be i mean well there's herbs but um a little bit later on is house of sham and catch fire pretty massive with them but yeah i mean i i'm so just like i'm so interested in so many different um <laughs> Spaces, so a lot of um like reggaeton i enjoy cumbia afrobeat sort of music um a lot of like grassroots sort of music from here and i don't even really listen to the radio that much anymore um mm. it's a lot of the stuff that i listen to is stuff that is friends that are coming out mm. from underground and and doing their own stuff and just more stuff that is relatable like we've got pretty cool bands and even single artists here in New Zealand now which are pretty pretty dope um got like Sweater, Mellow Downs, Diggy Dupe um that are taking taking the space like quite um with a storm which is really cool to see yeah I mean I don't Put it, put it on the Bluetooth, and I'll probably jam to it. <laughs> <laughs> nice, legit, legit. 
Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, the create the creativity that you sort of speak to and the natural ability to be who you are and where you're from sort of just comes out in our conversation. And I really appreciate that and having you on the episode. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Anything you'd like to speak to? Um, no, I feel like I've told you my whole life story now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. We got it here on Radical Narrative now. But yeah, no, I just thanks for um, reaching out. And um, it's really cool to hear, you know, that a lot of the things, how we see things, how I see things here uh, resonate, you know, with people on the other side of the planet. (laughs) Yeah, legitimately. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. so um, that's really cool. And yeah, it would be, um, I don't know, maybe we can catch up in a year's time and see what's happening again. Yeah, we'll do a follow-up episode, see what's going on, see where you're at in terms of you being a director and a producer and hey. <laughs> doing all the cool stuff yeah. you're doing. <laughs> and I, yeah, it might yeah. end up over that way at some point. So have a lot of film festivals. Um, yeah, so if any of our projects get in, um, I think we'll try to head over to um, support them if they get accepted and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Who knows? That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be cool yeah we'll definitely have to connect and catch up and and maybe even do an in-person episode one day yeah that'd be cool (laughs) yeah awesome i appreciate your time i appreciate you being here thank you so much for doing this